So with a name like Peter, James, John, Rose, and Dorothy, I could be talking about a few different things. Uh, we could be talking about a 1960s hippie band. We could be talking about the three main apostles, plus two you've never heard of. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to be talking about the motley crew of artists, uh, mostly European artists, that the first family of Colorado Springs befriended and how these visiting European artists tell us more about the history of the Pikes Peak region. So we're going to be talking about uh, artist Peter Lawrence Harrison, writer Henry James, renowned portrait artist John Singer Sargent, writer and artist Rose Kingsley, and watercolorist and diarist Dorothy Commons Carr. So although our topic today is about art and artists of the Pikes Peak region, and we've heard of two wonderful artists who have lived here and who have decided to make their careers and businesses here, this presentation focuses mainly on these European writers and artists who visited the region and their impressions of the American West um, as Europeans. So I'm going to be talking about these uh, through four main works of art. Rose Kingsley's book, South by West, John Singer Sargent's famous portrait of Elsie Palmer, Dorothy Commons Carr's diary, which is uh, uh, housed in the Starsmore uh, Center for Local History, and Peter Harrison's paintings of Garden of the Gods and Glenary. So William Jack General William Jackson Palmer and his wife Queen, together with their daughters Elsie, Dorothy, and Marjorie, are the founding family of Colorado Springs. General Palmer wanted the city to be rich in cultural life with churches, schools, and everything necessary to support a civilized um, and beautiful life. The stakes for the Fountain Colony, later known as Colorado Springs, of course, were driven in late July 1871. In the early days of the colony, Queen Palmer played a crucial role in establishing the cultural landscape of the new town by encouraging musical performances and by lending out her harmonium for worship services. In 1871, she met visiting a writer and artist, Rose Kingsley, who is the elder daughter of Charles Kingsley, the Victorian author best known for his novel, The Water Babies. Rose had crossed the Atlantic with her brother Maurice, who was one of William's business associates. He was getting ready to come and work with Palmer um, on the city and the railroad. So she decides that she's gonna come too, and she visits uh, the new colony, and she meets up with Queen Palmer. The two women quickly became friends and enjoyed exploring the Pikes Peak region together. And Kingsley made sketches of all of the scenery and kept a detailed diary of her visit. Queen were, and Rose were close in age, both were very small they shared a love of music and art, and so they quickly became pretty good friends. So in the earliest days of the rugged fountain colony, Queen relied on her friend to help her establish the cultural landscape of this new settlement. Queen began the first school in Colorado Springs in November 1871, and she taught classes until she decided she was done with that, and she turned her teaching duties over to Rose. In January 1872, the two friends became alarmed at the increasing number of saloons in Colorado City. The Fountain Colony was a dry colony, so they couldn't drink here, but they could drive just a little bit west and drink in Colorado City. And Rose and Queen were not happy about this. So they decided to organize a concert to raise funds for a new town reading room and library to give people something, other to, uh, some, something to do other than drink. So the program of this, um, concert featured Queen singing in her lovely mezzo-soprano voice, accompanied by Rose on the piano. The day of the concert, the weather was in the single digits, but it had warmed up from negative 19, uh, which it was during the practice sessions. So this weather was warm enough for 150 people to gather in Foots Hall. Queen Palmer sang three ballads, Maurice sang a number of folk songs, and ja Rose, because this is still cold, she had a jug of eggnog hidden under the piano and she would take a swig of it in between her songs so she could warm herself up. <laughs> She said, all went, uh, all went home delighted with their evening, and uh, the results of the reading room uh, was satisfactory. After all expenses, we netted $60, which was a credible amount for a town only five months old. So this was a big success. 
So after returning to England, her father Charles helped her publish her book, South by West, which included passages from her uh, diary and woodcut engravings that she made from her sketches. So she was keeping a diary. She was also sending in regular reports to the Gazette and was adapting these reports from the Gazette into the book uh, that we have today. So today the book is an engaging and detailed primary resource about the early days of Colorado Springs, Glen Airy, and the Palmer family. And here you can see um, some engravings from the book. Uh, you can see her impressions of Pikes Peak on the left, of Queens Canyon um, in Glen Airy in the middle, and then on the right we have the shanty that she and her brother Maurice lived in when they first arrived on the scene. So you can see this is, you know, definitely a, a rugged and rough type of place when they're arriving on the scene. So William and Queen had Elsie, their first baby, on October 30th, 1872. And eight years later, in 1880, Queen began, became pregnant with her second daughter, Dorothy. So during this pregnancy, Queen's friend, Alma Stradel, um, who is an English woman, visits uh, the family in Colorado. And the two friends are making their way up to Leadville on the carriage roads. And on the way home, um, eight-month pregnant Queen has a heart episode, uh, perhaps a heart attack, perhaps tachycardia. We're not sure from a modern medical perspective, but something happens, and she gets very, very sick. Uh, fortunately, she gives birth to a healthy baby, Dorothy, on October 29th, 1880. Queen's health continued to decline, and her doctors advised her to relocate to a more suitable climate. So she followed William to England while he was there on business and gave birth to her third daughter, Marjorie, in November 1881. So her health would become the main story of her life, um, trying to live in a place where, where she could stand the altitude, where the climate was conducive to her recovery. Recovery. Unfortunately, she was forced to relocate from Colorado, and they settled. Uh, she took her three young daughters with her, and they settled in New York in 1884, and eventually they wound up in England in 1886. So uh, she and the girls went to England where they remained for the rest of Queen's life and General Palmer remained in Colorado and he would visit the family as often as he could, uh, but the cross Atlantic voyage was long and arduous so the family was separated for um, a good bit of time. A group of loving friends and family anxiously awaited Queen in Queen's arrival in England, including Rose Kingsley. After her American expedition in the mid-1870s, Kingsley's book, South by West, continued to introduce British audiences to the charms of the American West. And in 1884, she started the Leamington High School for Girls, which um, had 17 students and three faculty members to start. The school is still in existence today and has been renamed the Kingsley School after its founder. So Queen's pal, Alma Stradle, and Alma's sister, Alice, and her husband, Jay Commons Carr, um, were key in making introductions uh, to, to Queen in her new life. So Alice and Jay Commons Carr had a daughter named Dorothy who was close in age to Queen's own children and would, would become close friends. So Queen and the girls lived in a uh, rented headquarters at Item Moat, one of the oldest medieval manor houses to survive in Kent. And the cars uh, introduced Queen to artist John Singer Sargent in 1887. And here we have a picture of John Singer Sargent with um, Alma Stradle. Um, this was taken later on uh, during a visit to the Swiss Alps. And I'll talk about that visit in a little bit later. So Sargent was a painter who was born in 1856 in Florence to American parents. His mother recognized his talent from an early age and decided to send him to art school throughout Europe. So he attended um, several different art schools. In 1874, he arrived in Paris. And if you know your art history, 1874 is a huge year in art history. It's the year that the group, this group of rebellious painters who would become known as the Impressionists are making their very first exhibit. So although Sargent is well known for being a beautiful realist painter, you can also see some Impressionist influences in his work. While in France, he met writer Henry James, and the two became lifelong friends. So here's a picture of Henry James. James was born in New York and traveled extensively throughout Europe, and he's most well known for his book, Portrait of a Lady. In 1886, James encouraged Sargent to move to England. Um, James was not impressed with the other English artists, and he wrote, Sargent is more intelligent about artistic things than all the painters here rolled together. 
James was key in helping Sargent become the internationally renowned artist uh, that we know him as today. And he would write articles into Harper's Monthly Magazine, you know, saying what a wonderful artist Sargent was and how American audiences needed to hire him to do commissions. And so that's how uh, John Singer Sargent began getting commissions all over the world. So he would frequently travel from Europe to America, just back and forth, um, painting these beautiful commissions. So the year that um, Sargent settled in England is when he met up with the Palmer family. And soon, Queen would meet Henry James herself. Uh, James was in his mid-40s at the time. And according to historian Tamara Teal, when James met Queen Palmer at Ina Mote in 1870, her intelligence and style confirmed his judgment about the star quality of American women. James described her as spontaneous, loquacious, and really charming. He was not as impressed with General Palmer, however. When he met General Palmer, Palmer arrived in a room, and James would later snarkily remark that Palmer arrived with the mud of the railroad on his boots. So you can see the impression that he had of General Palmer. And during his Christmas stay at Ida Moat, uh, James had, uh, was also staying at the place, and he stayed in the tower room, of which he later wrote, I slept in a room with a ghost and an oubliette. Fortunately, the former remained in the latter. So apparently Ida Moat has a famous ghost story, and James thought that he had met the ghost. After their initial meeting, Queen and James had an ongoing correspondence. So Teal notes that um, in these letters, James is not on a first name basis with Mrs. Palmer. Um, he always refers to her as Mrs. Palmer. Um, this is a social convention among well-behaved male and female friends, especially when one of them is married. Uh, Teal writes, to him, she was always Mrs. Palmer, a salutation that was actually understood um, that they would speak only on general topics and observations of England and America. In life. So the Pioneers Museum, the Starsmore Center, has these letters, and most of these letters consist of James turning down invitations that Queen is sending him. So she's inviting him to dinner, she's inviting him to visit her, and he spends most of the time writing her and just declining invitations. Uh, one in particular, on October 6, 1893, he writes, Dear Mrs. Palmer, your invitation to your charming home is so gracious that I feel really brutal and not responding to it earlier. But the hard fact is I am absolutely unable to leave London for the rest of the month. Know now that vision enhances fortitude and sharpens the regret of your very gracious and disappointed Henry James. So the next time you guys turn down an invitation, just think of Henry James and make a beautiful response to that invitation. John Singer Sargent, however, would prove to be a much more regular and faithful companion over the years. So in 1889, he painted a portrait of Alma Stradle. Uh, William and Queen decided to commission Sargent to paint a portrait of Elsie, who was getting ready to turn 17 years old. And that summer, uh, this is Sargent at work, uh, that summer he did three different studies, at least three studies of Elsie, as he's preparing for the portrait. So um, hopefully most of you have seen the portrait, the final portrait, this hanging in the Fine Arts Center, but here are the three studies. And as an artist myself, I love the pen and ink drawing that Sargent has done on the, um, on the left. And these studies here, I think, depict Elsie as a little bit more age appropriate. Um, she is just turned 17, and I think these oil studies depict her as um, a little bit more youthful. Uh, it, I think that you really see that she is a teenager, um, a little bit innocent, a little bit naive. Um, and I think that comes across a little bit better in these uh, studies than it does in the final painting. So sitting for this uh, final portrait began the day after her 17th birthday. And she recorded this event in her journal. The first time she met Sargent, she remarked, Mr. Sargent came, and of him there is much to say, although one hardly knows how to begin. All I will say is that one feels a great deal of trust in him and sure of sympathy and trouble. So um, the, she sits for her portrait over the course of several months, and by December, the weather is growing increasingly gloomy. So he moves outside to paint, and he paints um, Alma Stradle and uh, the, the Palmer Party as they are playing a game of bowls on the lawn. So Sargent finally finishes the painting of uh, Miss Elsie Palmer in 1890, uh, in uh, December of 1890. 
Also in December of 1890, Aunt Alma Stradle married a painter named Peter Lawrence Harrison, who is 15 years her junior. This is also um, another study that he did of Elsie Palmer as well, of John Singer Sargent. So Auntie Alma marries a painter named Peter Harrison. According to author Donna Lucy, Peter was an artist who did more talking about his work than actual painting. He suffered equally from depression and from procrastination. He was also very jealous of his friend John Singer Sargent's ability to churn out paintings so quickly and for so much profit. In the fall of 1894, he sent a, quote, questionable letter to Elsie, who was 22 years old at the time, and the contents of this letter remain mysterious, although this did begin a years-long um, correspondence between the two of them. We know that Elsie and Peter had a flirtatious friendship at the very least, uh, more likely an actual romance. So Alma, Peter, and John Singer Sargent remained part of the Palmer girls' lives long after Queen's untimely death at 44 in 1894. Um, so let's fast forward to 1902. General Palmer brought his daughters to the Swiss Alps. 30-year-old Elsie was reunited with Peter and her old friend John Singer Sargent. And after this expedition, uh, the family stops over in England where they are reunited with their old friend, Dorothy Commons Carr who was becoming talented um, in watercolor painting. And they decided to bring her along with them to Colorado so she could paint the scenery. So uh, Dorothy Commons Carr, Dorothy Palmer, um, who Dorothy Commons Carr refers to as Doss, and General Palmer, um, they split up from the main party and they go ahead and head home while Elsie and Marjorie remain in England uh, with Peter Harrison. So, paint, uh, and eventually, Peter Harrison brings Elsie and Marjorie back to Colorado. So, both Dorothy Commons Carr and Peter Harrison are arriving in Colorado in 1903. So, Ms. Commons Carr was a skilled diarist, and we know much about life at Glenary and Colorado Springs from her journals. She arrives in, spring, in the Springs on December 20th in the middle of a blizzard, feeling very tired and squeamish. And she writes of her impression. She says, it looks like the end of the world, it cannot be the same world that holds England. The house stands at a gorge of the mountains among fierce red rocks that start up everywhere like debris of an unfinished universe. So by spring, she's finally feeling a little bit better. She's, you know, feeling a little irritated and a little overwhelmed by this new landscape. Uh, but by spring, she decides that she's going to start painting again. And in her diary on March 9th, she remarks, a lovely day, I painted outdoors the first time since January. In the afternoon, Doss and I rode into town and back to do a lot of shopping. I heard that strikers fired on the sentries today, but nothing further occurred in Cripple Creek. So here she is referring to the mining strike that's happening up in Cripple Creek. So uh, Peter Harrison brings Elsie and Marjorie back to uh, uh, to America, and he paints this picture of Garden of the Gods while he is here. So um, Dorothy Commons Carr makes no mention of a secret romance happening between Elsie and Peter at the time, but we do know that uh, they are exchanging some very steamy letters. And after uh, Peter's return to um, after Peter's return to England, they continue to send letters back and forth. Uh, Harrison will return to uh, the States again in 1906, where he painted this portrait of um, Glenary. So this is a picture of the renovated Glenary in 1904, and you can see the, the um, castle tower that we have in the background there today. So what happened to all of these people? Um, eventually, Peter Harrison turned his attention to Elsie's younger sister, Dorothy. So uh, Dorothy was staying with the Harrison family, and he would later write to Elsie about her sister's beautiful, delicate lines of throat and neck. And of course, Elsie is absolutely furious about this, and she breaks off a relationship, and Dorothy soon becomes pretty commonly known as Peter Harrison's mistress. Um, Elsie herself would get married to Leopold Hamilton Myers, who is an English writer in 1908. And then Marjorie, the youngest sister, would marry um, Dr. Watts, who is the physician that moved into the house after General Palmer's death. So 
all of these writers and artists, I just think it's interesting to note um, that these European artists and writers who are visiting the Springs are um, just encountering the West in a really different way than those of us who have lived here a long time have. You know, they're very impressed with the scenery and the landscape. Uh, Peter Harrison is grappling with the beautiful light um, that happens here um, that plays on the Red Rocks and um, the beautiful home of Glenary that's in the valley. Rose Kingsley, of course, is grappling with uh, coming to this coming to this area in um, you know a fledgling colony and living in a shack and um, you know of course writer Henry James uh, who did not visit the Palmer family in the in the in the in Colorado, but he's commenting on uh, that some social class and some of the, the new money and the way that these new industrialists are having to make their money. So I hope that uh, I hope that you guys have enjoyed hearing more about these other artists. Thank you.